Okay, bye, everyone. Sure, whatever. Costume slash transition change. Okay, so how is everyone today? I had a haircut. Yeah, camera. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, don't you think they're fascinating? You go and get a haircut. You ask for something you want. In my case, I wanted Matthew Perry from Friends. But you never quite get what you're hoping for. It's quite like Christmas. You're really hoping for that new Pokemon or Crash Bandicoot game. Any grandma makes you a sweater. Good times. Good times. Anyway, on to the subject of this video. My top 10 games of 2012. Incidentally, I do like my new haircut. Just for point that out. Before we begin, I'd like to say that I haven't played every game this year, so stuff like Borderlands 2, Epic Mickey 2, Paper Mario, I haven't had a chance to play them yet. I will get round to them, but not just yet. I'd also like to state that this is my list. Feel free to leave your list slash opinions down in the comment section below, or in a bloody letter attached to a rock which I'll find in my lounge, providing it hasn't bludgeoned me to death when you threw it through the window. Please don't do that. Also, as a side note, I will get back to doing vlogs and reviews each month. It's just I've been busy with doing new Let's Plays and... Yeah, they take a while. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's harder than you think, seriously. It's editing. Writing. Yeah. Anyway, on with the list. Firstly, let's mention some runners-up. Those games which I really enjoyed, but just not enough to make the list itself. New Super Mario Bros. 2 for the 3DS. The idea of collecting an insane amount of coins is brilliant. Did I like it because I like getting high scores? Yes. Did I like it because I was excited for the challenge to collect 1 million coins? Yes. Did I like it because I love money? Ooh, you betcha. It was a fun game, although fairly easy in comparison to its predecessors. But with the added DLC, they fixed the issue by adding some truly challenging levels. They were playing Kaiser Mario at the time, weren't they? Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. I knew it was going to be fun, but not nearly as fun as I ended up having. The game had a variety of tracks, mostly from the Sonic franchise, and a lot of characters. Again, mostly from the Sonic franchise. But everything was so smooth and felt great, and... Mmm, I do love me a good racing game. Unfortunately, there were those tracks which infuriated me to my very core. Burning depths. I'm looking at you here. Not just looking, I'm staring at you. Strainy eyes! Also, the fact that I had to redo every race again to get a higher ranking to earn stars for the final few levels annoy me, but eh, what are you gonna do? The game did have its glitches, but they weren't too bad. For the most part. Oh lord! What was that? Oh dear. What?! What the fuck? I have broken the game and I'm not in luck. Okay, I am now. Took long enough. What? Oh my lord. I, why am I moving so slowly? I'm, I'm still on the boat? What the fuck? Speaking of glitchy games, Assassin's Creed 3. When I, well, my Sam played most of it, when we played it, I was enjoying it, but I've learned that we were apparently the luckiest people alive. You see, apart from floating weapons or floating people or draw distance, we didn't really experience any glitches, apart from the game freezing in the cutscene after a boss. Upon receiving comments, particularly in the last two chapters of the game, I discovered that most had issues with chasing down Templars as they were either going too fast or you would randomly stop, etc, 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 and there's no way to complete the game. This happened to apparently everyone except us. Seriously, I looked at Let's Plays, everyone had these glitches except us. Regardless, I didn't like it nearly enough to go on the list, so it's here. PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Would I like Crash Bandicoot and Spyro to be in it? Yes, yes I would. Do they need to be in it? No, not really. This game is so much fun regardless of whether they're in it. Is it a Super Smash Bros. clone? Yes, and no. Whilst it does have similarities, it's the ultimate smashes that make it exciting. In Brawl, when someone gets a final smash, they will use it instantly to take you down, because otherwise someone can take it from them. In this, you have the option of having it at level 1, 2 or 3. 
Each powerful in their own right, but becoming more powerful the higher you level up. With the exception of Ratchet, because he's amazingly overpowered at level 1, and I fucking love it! There's a massive strategy to the game, one that you can't see easily unless you play it. It's truly fantastic. Little Big Planet Karting. Little Big Planet has always been fun. You can create your own little world for people to explore, as long as it's child friendly. Remember, we do not appreciate levels called the Adorable Unicorn to have multiple phallic objects. Thank you for your consideration in the future. Medium Molecule. As some of you know, I love racing games. They're very entertaining. But this is an infinite racing game, and I love it. Of all the things to praise about this game, the controls are the best thing. The kart drives so smoothly in the weapon system, it's actually fair. <laughs> Imagine that, right? After years of Mario screwing you over with a blue shell, you can finally be free from the unfair bullshit that will hit you centimeters on the finish line. Also, Stephen Fry talks a lot in this game, and I love me some Stephen Fry in my video games. Why isn't he in all video games? I don't know why this isn't on the list. I love it, but I guess just not quite as much as the others. Doctor Who The Eternity Clock. I love Doctor Who. I love Matt Smith. So there was no doubt I was going to love it if it was made well. And what do you know, it was glorious. This game took the essence of the show and made it into a game. They brought back Cybermen, the Silence, the Daleks, they even had some really great bosses. As Nine would say, fantastic. The game went a bit Team Fortress 2 with the hat collecting, but that's okay, hats are cool. As our both items on the game. I was so close to putting this on the list, but other things were just better. Well. With the games that didn't make it onto the list over, let's get down to the actual list. Number 10. Wonder Book, Book of Spells. When seeing this at E3, my initial reaction was... <laughs> but I bought it anyway thinking it might actually be good. I thought to myself, the demonstrations didn't really make it look good, but it might be good. And it so was. I love Harry Potter. I was worried it was going to be a very poor way of making more money out of a franchise, which it technically is, but it was so much fun! You learn about the spells through interesting or funny stories of the wizards and witches who first used them, and you get to try them out too in a fun minigame. What's not to love? The only real gripe I had was that it was very hard to do in terms of let's playing. The game does a lot of talking, so knowing when to talk is tough. Oh well. Whilst it is a bit short, it's still great and somewhat groundbreaking, hence why it's on the list. Number 9. Mario Party 9. Lots of people complained about this game before playing because they altered the formula. Lots of people complained after playing because they altered the formula. I, however, loved it. Yes, it was different, but there was nothing wrong with it. Sure, there were less mini-games and you didn't have to collect stars, but there were bosses and board gimmicks which changed the game to make it more exciting than before. Plus, it gave me an excuse to use my Toad voice. Hey Mario! Press the A button to roll the dice! Oh fuck, it's Bowser! Also, the music in this game was truly stunning. I loved it. Did you? Let's have a listen. Number 8. Need for Speed Most Wanted 2012. For those of you who don't know, I entered the contest with Machinima to record, edit, render and upload the most videos of this game in a week. I worked non-stop uploading about 24 hours of footage with commentary. It could have been more if I didn't have to work on one of those days. I went through mental torture making myself test my limits to get this up. Five grand is a lot of money to win, incidentally I still don't know who's won. And yet, after all I went through, I still wanted to play more. I played this thing non-stop for a week and did pretty much everything in single player, forcing me to record online for 4 hours. The online was like nothing I had seen before. It was unique and I was amazed at how fun it was, so much so that I actually went back and played it again. After a week's break. I enjoyed it but I'm not stupid. Number 7. Sonic 4 Episode 2. I really enjoyed Sonic 4 Episode 1, even if others didn't, so I was definitely looking forward to this. Especially after hearing that they changed the engine, making the graphics crisper, smoother, and making the gameplay feel sublime. But that was to be seen. I'd have to play it to know for sure. And they succeeded. 
I've always loved Sonic for its fast pace, but this time, the gameplay wasn't the thing that pleased me the most. I love my video game music. It's crucial for it to be good and to set the scene for each area. Without the right music, the location is barren, regardless of how much life you pour into the place. The music in this game was top notch. Have a listen. Yet, that wasn't what pleased me the most either. Metal Sonic was. I love Metal Sonic. I think he's the best villain in the Sonic franchise. In this game, they made him play his part perfectly. Be Sonic's equal. Nothing more, nothing less. Sonic is always supposed to come out on top, but Metal was a decent boss every time he appeared without evolving into some stupid Metal Mutant. Yes, look at you here, Sonic Heroes. The abomination from that game still lingered since Metal Sonic hadn't really been a boss since then. Yes, he was in Generations, but that's just a repeat of Sonic CD. In the next game, I hope we see modern Sonic vs Metal. That will be the battle to see who's greater. I assure you. Number 6. Nintendo Land. This game came out about half a month ago <coughs> in Europe. <coughs> but just because it's recent doesn't mean it doesn't deserve to be on this list. What do you get if you take 12 Nintendo franchises and turn them into incredible minigames for you to play, each with their own gimmick for the Wii U gamepad? You get this. Each minigame was fun and enjoyable, both on your own and with others. It's pretty much the perfect opening game to the system. If you need a system seller, this right here is the way to go. My favourite games in terms of two player has to go to Mario Chase. That game is incredibly fun, albeit a bit tense. My favourite single player, although it does have multiplayer fun, goes to The Legends of Zelda Battle Quest. I love Zelda games, particularly Wind Waker, I've been playing that a lot recently, although I don't care much for Skyward Sword. But this game is so much fun, a rich environment, fantastic remixes, hours of fun. Can't go wrong there. Number 5. New Super Mario Bros. U. Again, only recently out because it was the launch title for the Wii U, and you know what? Hands down, the best 2D Mario game. Apart from Super Mario World. This game captured the magic of Super Mario World, and apparently Kaizo Mario. World 6, if you're playing alone, is unbearably difficult. I became very frustrated. This could have been because I had a cold at the time, and was a bit annoyed because of that. But the game is genuinely very difficult, especially World 9 2. Oh. My. God. No! I will go through all this pain. Take a bullet straight through my brain. Yes, I would play Mario for ya, but you wouldn't do the same. You wouldn't do the same. You couldn't take the pain. No, you'd never take the pain. It's so fucking hard. How many lives? How many? I had 99 at one point. I don't anymore. No! Go Mario, go, run like your life's depending on it. Yes! <laughs> My only real complaint for this game would have to be that they didn't change any of the music. It was just the same old generic music. It did have new songs, but it was mostly the same. Number 4. My first Pokemon game was Sapphire. My favourite Pokemon game is Emerald, an extended version of my first Pokemon game. If they remade Emerald or Sapphire or Ruby, that'd probably become my favourite. No Pokemon game has come close to being as good as Emerald in my eyes. At least, not until now. Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 was absolutely incredible. The art style, the music, the story gets it. I genuinely thought he had a chance to destroy Unova. I also spent a good portion of the game thinking, who the hell is this Colrez? Is, is he going to betray us? Is he really a scientist? Who is he? Everything this game had to offer, I loved, and there was plenty to do. I think that's why I enjoy Emerald so much. After beating the game, you have the Battle Frontier, which took me a good 35 hours to take down. It isn't easy. The game has so many things to do afterwards in terms of extra bosses or legendaries, or just loads of Unova to visit. It's great. Let's not forget the Pokemon World Tournament. That is the best thing ever! Getting the chance to fight Steven again? Hell yes! I'm really hoping for an Emerald remake next. 
since it's the only region not on the DS, but we'll have to wait and see. To wrap up my thoughts on this game, I'll just say this. If you want a DS Pokemon game, look no further than this game right here. It's easily one of the best games on the DS. Number 3. The Jack and Daxter HD Collection and the Ratchet and Clank HD Collection. What madness is this, Teal? Two games at the number 3 spot? Yes. Well, if you want to be pedantic, technically six games. I thought I'd combine these two games since they're remakes, but regardless of how you want to organise your list, I felt it wrong having two HD games at high spots in my list, so I combined them. These games were the best the PS2 had to offer, and to have them remade is pretty much an instant buy from me. Well, an instant hurry to Amazon to pre-order months in advance. These series were rivals, but the companies were really good friends. If you're looking for the peak of platforming combined with weapons, these games were for you. Jack and Daxter still to this day has some of the best plot twists I've ever encountered, especially Jack 3. I genuinely didn't see them coming. There are three huge plot twists in Jack 3 in the space of about five minutes. Seriously, one will make you cry, one will make you laugh, but you're not prepared for it. Wretched has always gone for the Make him laugh, make him laugh, don't you know everyone wants to laugh approach which works very well. In terms of music, neither of them go wrong in that department, both having unique themes to their situations slash locations and always excite me. I think it's only fair to let you listen to some of it. In terms of gameplay, they're both similar but very different. Ratchet has many huge planets to explore, although it's linear it doesn't feel like it. Jack and Daxter is an open world where you'll travel to find missions, sort of like a tamer Grand Theft Auto. Ratchet and Clank is fairly easy for the most part. The series whilst having its challenging sections focuses more on the enjoyment you get by blasting an enemy with a giant lava gun. Jack and Daxter, however, has some insane difficulty, especially in the second instalment of the series. The checkpoints in that game are unfair beyond measure. If you're looking for a challenge, you'll find it here, especially in hero mode. But it's still fun regardless. 
Both are as good as each other, and it's great to see them both out once more. Number 2. In 2011, I let's play the game which put me on the map. A game which I and many others didn't think looked good. I had never seen gameplay for it, just cheesy cutscenes for advertising. The only reason I was drawn to it was the fact that Spyro the Dragon's name was in the title. I slagged the game off with my friend Ultima in our Monster Inc. Let's Play and regretted it after playing it. I bought Skylander Spyro's Adventure thinking I'd give it a go. I said from the get go I wouldn't buy any more of the toys that came with it unless it was one of the best games I had ever played. I ended up buying nearly all of them. Activision ended up thanking me for doing a good job with the Let's Play and I actually stayed in contact with Mike Stout, one of the men at Activision. This year they released a sequel, Skylanders Giants. This game takes everything that the first did right and made it a thousand times better, and anything they did wrong they fixed. This game was flawless, funny, entertaining, and the music was unbelievable. This game blew me away more than the first did. I knew it was going to be good, but I had no idea how much fun I was going to have. Some people may be put off by the fact that it's for the KID demographic. Don't be. The game is stunning. Oh, but I have to buy toys, that's too babyish. No, it isn't! It's groundbreaking. As a gamer, you should be open to new things, and this new piece of technology is amazing. Not only is it amazing, it's unique and has opened the floodgates to how DLC can be received. Did you know that the Wii U gamepad works like a portal of power from Skylanders? The Rayman Legends trailer proves this. Oh yeah! Activision just changed the future. How do you like that, FPS and classic Spyro-only fanboys? Since I generally see a lot of hate from the Call of Duty fanboys, I think it's only fair to mention that the people who made Skylanders made Call of Duty. Yeah! Who's laughing now? So, we've seen a whole range of games. But what's the number one spot? Do you think you can guess it? Hudson. They got T-62 tanks in support. We need you to take the heat off. Only joking. <laughs> I haven't played Call of Duty. It's actually... Goalkeeper just got there. And that'll be a corner. Nope, not that either. I don't really like football games much. The real number one is... Number one. Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance. I'm a huge fan of the Kingdom Hearts series. This is a well-known fact for my regular viewers. I knew this game was going to be good. It was the game that would set the stage for Kingdom Hearts 3, a game which would apparently end the Xehanort Saga. I'm gonna be honest, if this game hadn't took risks or wasn't released this year, Skylanders would have been the top spot, but boy did this game take some risks. As you'd expect, the gameplay feels great, smooth and enjoyable. This time, however, they added flow motion, which is a new way to move around and attack. It's great fun, though I prefer the game without it. As you'd expect, the music in this game is amazing. Have a listen.
In this game, you're separated into playing as Riku and Sora, switching between two when your drop meter runs out. Turns out you're both in a dream world. That's no big spoiler. This, however, is going to spoil parts at the end of the game. If you want to skip to after I spoil it, click the annotation below. You'll have a few seconds to do so. Three, two, one. So, you don't mind being spoiled? Good. This game wouldn't be number one if it wasn't for what it did in the final world of the game. Up until now, everyone has had a different theory on everyone's roles as what they'd do to help Xehanort. In Kingdom Hearts Coded, it was announced that once the Heartless, Ansem, and the Nobody, Xemnas, were defeated, the original would return. Meaning that all this time, Xehanort knew he'd return someday to finish what he started himself. He's not only done just that, he's brought every form of himself to the same place to create 13 darknesses. The time travel element in this game is unique. If a part of you has existed at some point in time and you possess the ability to time travel, you can go there. Once you return to your normal time, you forget all that you have done. This works exquisitely well for Xehanort. He has his 13 darknesses. Well, he's missing one. All Xehanort has to do is go back in time and visit each of his forms to make them understand what they have to do for his plan to succeed. And of course, he has to tell his younger self so he'll know how to do it in the future slash know he's done it. It's complicated, but at the same time it's not. We know who half of them are, his forms such as Terranor, Ansem, etc. However, let's look closer. Riku was once a part of Ansem, making him a darkness. If he went forward in time with Ansem, he wouldn't remember, meaning Riku could very easily be in the room when they tried to get the 13 darknesses. It makes sense since some of the darknesses had organization cloaks covering their faces, so Riku wouldn't know he was there or remember him being there in the first place. This also raises the question of if Riku has a secret nobody. He was technically one to Heartless. There's so many more things that could happen and so many more plot twists after what I have said, but this game took many risks with what it did, and if it didn't, Kingdom Hearts 3 wouldn't be as exciting as it could be. So that's my list. I hope you enjoyed the video. On the right is one of my reviews, check it out if you enjoyed this, or subscribe, that would be really nice of you. On the left is Emma Blackery, you have to check out her videos, she's incredibly funny, intelligent, beautiful and she has an amazing voice. It's like a bad movie, she is looking groovy, if you were me then you'd be screaming someone shoot me. Some of her videos are a lot like community channels, which is a very good thing, believe me. If you don't click the annotation to her channel, you're seriously missing out. Her videos are amazing. She's amazing. She has an amazing sense of humour. It'll even take you to a different tab. It won't take much of your time. It'll be worth it, I promise. If you're not going to watch more of her videos, I will. Anyway, that's all for me. See ya, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, night, day, week, month, Christmas, New Year, birthday, any other holiday. Toodaloo! Oh, and here's some bloopers. Hey! Oh my god! Ow! Ah! Ah! <laughs> Fuck! Luckily, this chair is fucking big. I love haircuts. Fun and fascinating. You you go in, and you you forget your lines, and and. You stand awkwardly with a Dalek prepared to shoot you in the face. But lights getting in my eyes and it's reflecting off the Dalek. It's not good. It's not. It's not good. I need. I need a new poster. What am I doing? <laughs> Become. Become. <laughs>